Dr. Murray Goldstein is the first osteopathic physician to serve as a commissioned medical officer in the United States Public Health Service and as a member of the staff of the National Institutes of Health. The final 13 years of his four decades at the NIH, he served as the director of the NIH National Institutes of Neurological Disorders and Stroke. He was an assistant surgeon general in the U.S. Public Health Service with a two-star rank of rear admiral. While Dr. Goldstein's accomplishments at the NIH are many, it was because of his curiosity and stroke that first led him to the Neurology Institutes where he ultimately recognized the deficiency in cerebral palsy research within the NIH and INDS and helped establish the first cerebral palsy research program. He claims to have retired in 2003. However, he took on several new roles after that time that made a difference in cerebral palsy research and the lives of those who live with CP. As director of United Cerebral Palsy Research and Education Foundation, he saw a need to develop young cerebral palsy research investigators and worked with the board to fund their projects. His work as medical director of UCP led to clinics serving adults around the country. Later, in what is now known as the Middle East Project, he led teams of Palestinian, Israeli, and Jordanian therapists and physicians to create developmental clinics to help children with CP get the care they needed. Dr. Goldstein says that often he was at the right place at the right time and he was given opportunities to prove himself that others did not have. Or was it because he was humble, hardworking, and honest and willing to support the work of others? He probably won't tell you that before medical school, he served in the U.S. Army during World War II and is the recipient of a Purple Heart, or that he has received multiple honorary degrees in medicine and a U.S. Presidential Letter of Commendation, among many, many other accolades. Dr. Goldstein and his wife were married 67 years. She passed away peacefully in 2020 at the age of 104. They have two daughters, five grandchildren, and 12 great-grandchildren. Dr. Goldstein remains active in his community, having served three terms on his housing committee's board of directors. Additionally, he enjoys exercise, swimming in the summer months, reading, and spending time with family. Dr. Goldstein, thank you so much for joining me today. I'm, I'm really looking forward to this interview with you. With the, you're, you're a true trailblazer in cerebral palsy, and I'm grateful to have you here for the past presidents and trailblazers of the American My Academy. pleasure. It's my pleasure. Thank you. So you have said that you were in the right place at the right time and that you were given opportunities to prove yourself because you were an osteopath and not an MD. Can you tell us about all how that happened? How the, What was the beginning like? Oh, well, for many, many, many years, the osteopathic profession was completely isolated from the medical profession. The people, the offices of the medical profession had come to a decision that osteopaths, DOs, were not adequately prepared to provide health care nationally. This was, frankly, a political decision, but okay. The time had come in the uh, 19, early 1950s, osteopathic physicians were growing in number nationally and had to be recognized as such. And so the osteopathic profession decided the time had come to test the blackboard against osteopaths nationally. And it had decided to use the U.S. Public Health Service as its instrument. Uh, one of the reasons for this was a man by the name of Nelson Rockefeller. Mr. Rockefeller had been governor of New York for many years, a member of the famous Rockefeller family, and was at this time a assistant secretary in the department, the Federal Department of Health, Education, and Welfare. And the U.S. Public Health Service was one of the organizations that was managed and controlled by the Public Health Service. 
Incidentally, Mr. Rockefeller's personal physician was an osteopathic physician. And so they decided the time had come to test the role of osteopaths for the future. In order to join the public health service, one had to take an examination, a medical exam. This was true across the board. And then, uh, shall I say, survive an interview. How they chose a young osteopathic physician in Des Moines, Iowa, affiliated with the school there, I have no idea. They never shared that. But I got a phone call one day from the president of the osteopathic medical school. I was working across the street in the osteopathic hospital, asking if I could please come over. The president wanted to see me. Well, I was a little shocked. Uh, it's not very often a young resident gets asked to see the president, and I wondered what I had done wrong. Anyway, I went over and saw him, Dr. Peters, a lovely man. And Dr. Peters said, uh, Dr. Goldstein, Murray, I want you to do me a favor. And I said, why, well, certainly, sir. He said, I want you to go to Kansas City and take the written exam for the public health service. And I said, well, could you tell me why I'm not interested in the public health service? As a matter of fact, your staff has offered me a position here at the school. He said, oh, don't worry about that. Just go on and take the exam, and then you, I'll pay your expenses, drive to Kansas City. And okay. So I drove to Kansas City uh, about two weeks later when the exam was ready, and I uh, wrote the exam. It, it wasn't a difficult medical exam, but nothing unusual. Had dinner that night at a lovely hotel, which for a resident was very nice. Next morning, uh, across the river, this was Kansas City, Kansas, across the river in Kansas City, Missouri. Oh, excuse me, it's the other way around. Kansas City, Kansas is a federal institution. It's a large federal hospital. And I had an oral interview there with the medical doctor, a public health service officer in charge of the medical care of the patients there. The, the prisoners were all were at, the prison was called Leavenworth. And so I spent a half day there with him, him questioning me about my background and my education, uh, taking me into the clinic and uh, I watched him actually examine one patient. After lunch, we said farewell. I went back to the hotel, got my luggage, and went back to Des Moines. And quite frankly, absolutely forgot about the whole thing. Uh, it was an interesting experience. Okay. Well, about three weeks later, I got a phone call from Washington from an assistant Surgeon General of the Public Health Service, saying, Dr. Goldstein, uh, can you come to Washington? I'd like to interview you. Well, this came as a bit of a shock. I uh, wasn't prepared. And so uh, I said, well, you know, I'm a resident on duty. I can't just pack up and leave. Let me check it out about when I'd be free. Well, I went back and saw Dr. Peter. And he said, well, Murray, you've got a nice invitation. You, you ought to really go. Again, I'll pay your expenses and uh, see what this man, his name was, by the way, Dr. Murray, uh, what Dr. Murray has in mind. So I packed my bag on an airplane flight, flew to Washington, and the next morning had an interview with Dr. Murray. Again, he was a lovely guy. Very nice. We spent most of the time him wanting to learn what osteopathic medicine was and how was it in any way different from what we called allopathic medicine. And I explained it to him. 
that fundamentally we took the entire medical course that taught in a medical school. But in addition, in addition, as an add we learned a technology and philosophy called manipulative medicine. And so we were also doing manipulative therapy as well as the usual drugs, surgery, what have you. Well, after we were pretty much finished with our conversation, he looked at his watch and said, oh my, it's getting to be close to noon. You have an appointment at the NIH. And there's a limit, government limousine downstairs that'll take you out there. Okay, I said. Got her in the limousine and drove out to Bethesda. Well, I must admit, when I got onto the grounds of NIH, I was impressed. Uh, here was this beautiful park-like area with magnificent buildings. Uh, and I knew that it was one of the research centers of the United States, medical research. In any case, I was driven to a building, the headquarters of the National Heart Institute. Went in and met the director, Dr. James Watt. By the way, Dr. Watt and I later became close personal friends. And I was introduced to Dr. Watt. We talked for a while. We had lunch. And at the conclusion of lunch, he said, Well, Murray, tell me, what research have you done? And I said, Dr. Watt, I've never done research. I'm a medical physician. I take care of sick people. Uh, I just have never done research. And he said, oh, that's no problem. He said, I can assign you to one of our people in three weeks. You'll be doing research. When can you get here? And I said, when can I get here? He said, oh, yes. He said, you're being offered a commission as a medical officer in the public health service, and this will be your assignment, the NIH and the Heart Institute. Well, this kind of flipped me back. And I was trying to think of how do I answer the question without answering it. And I said, well, Dr. What? Uh, nobody at my institution is aware that uh, I'm being considered here and I'm on duty. I'm a doctor in the hospital. I've got to go back and do my things and let me give you a call after I get home and talk to my boss. And he said, fine, Murray, whenever you're ready, give me a call and we'll have a place for you. And so I went back to Des Moines and saw the president and told him about this. And he said, well, Murray, this is quite an opportunity. You will be the first osteopathic physician as commissioned medical officer in any of the uniform service. And here you being offered a job in the largest research organization in the world. What do you think? I said, well, okay, let's agree to this. I will go there for two to three years and learn to do research. And then I'll come back here and we'll start a research program. And he said, okay, Murray, let's try that. And so I called Dr. Watt and arranged two months later to come to Bethesda and learn to do research. And so what had happened behind the scenes, so they later heard is Mr. Rockefeller, the Assistant Secretary of the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare, and his doctor, and I'll say past physician, had decided the time had come to break the black. And that's what was happening. Again, I have no idea, none at all, how they found a young man in Des Moines, Iowa, to serve in this role. So that's how I entered the National Heart Institute and uh, as a commissioned medical officer. 
and three years became 40 years. And <laughs> yeah, well, of course, I was learning research, and I'm a very slow learner. It took me 40 years. <laughs> uh, well, I went to work in the Heart Institute, had a wonderful, wonderful man who helped me learn research. And for reasons I had been interested when I was in Des Moines in the area of stroke. Mm -hmm. I just wondered, why did people have strokes? And why did certain people, like blacks, have more stroke than whites? Mm -hmm. Why did that happen? Et cetera, et cetera. And so I started my own research program under my sponsor's guidance in stroke research. That leads me to my next question. And, and you know, your interest in cerebral palsy kind of came because your interest in stroke and then you, you became an administrative, it was, it was an administrative endeavor, really. Um, and you were the head of NINDS at NIH at this point. And you were a good steward of the budget, this giant budget that you had. Um, and you noticed that there was a deficiency um, in developmental disabilities. And, you know, this this task and, and cerebral palsy that, you know, your interest started with stroke. And then you've got this big budget and and all of a sudden you're 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 looking at, a, at a, another area. And that's kind of how you came into our world. I was doing stroke research and realized that the heart institute was not the appropriate place for stroke research. Right, right. And so I spoke to Dr. Watt, and he spoke to the director of the neurology. Mm -hmm. And they, Dr. And they agreed I would transfer to the neurology institute. Again, still doing stroke. And the transfer was made was very little difficult. Well, I went on with my stroke research, and by the way, I, I was joyously very successful in, yeah. and getting a lot of work done. Well, you know, in any organization, if you do a good job, they promote you. And generally, when they promote you, it's not doing what you're doing, you generally slowly accumulate administrative responsibility, putting you in charge of other people. And slowly, slowly, I was getting more and more responsibility for administrative research, research, what the administration of research in the Neurology Institute. And to make a long story short, in 1993, I became director of the Neurology mm -hmm. with absolutely no research program of my own. I was responsible for the Institute. It had a half million dollar a year budget. It had 80 people working on the campus, and my hands were full. Mm -hmm. Well, when I became director, I very carefully sat down and reviewed all the research that the Neurology Institute and its staff was doing, and they were doing a very good job. But I noticed one thing, that all of the research, remember this is Neurology Institute, all of the research was focused on disorders with adults. And it was doing very well, but practically nothing was going on in the area of childhood neurological disorder. And I went into consultation with a number of people on the staff, and we agreed that the time had come for us to include developmental neurology. That means development of the brain and its difficulties. And the most 
obvious one, one cerebral palsy. And so the decision was not made from cerebral palsy to the Neurology Institute. It was for a new leader to try to fill in the gaps. And there was cerebral palsy. And so I put some money aside, got a few good people thinking about it, and we started a small cerebral palsy research program. In reviewing it, I learned that we knew practically nothing about it, and that all of, not all, but nearly all of the information was suppositions, and that the evidence, the scientific evidence, wasn't there to back it up. And so we started slowly working. And my leadership team, I can't take credit for it, I was just part of the team, came to the recognition that maybe the supposition was not correct as to why cerebral palsy occurred. It was thought of as something that happened in the few months after birth of a child, that whether it was an infection or trauma or something happened in those first few months of life that altered the brain so that its development was injured and this young infant developed the neuromuscular difficulty that it had as it was mature. But you know what? There was no evidence that was true. It was a reasonable supposition. And so we went looking, and we started some programs, not only on our campus, but making funds available outside to investigators. And I'm sorry to say we didn't get very much interest. Uh, it wasn't a hot topic. Uh, these investigators were working in their own field. Okay. But anyway, we stopped. And I say one of my accomplishments is turning the attention of the NIH to a thing we call cerebrals, even though its success was minimal. Well, at, as this was going on, I was just finishing 40 years at the NIH and 10 years as the executive director of the institute. And I decided that it was not wise for an organization that large, that rich, to have a director for many more years, that a turnover was necessary in leadership in order to allow new approaches, new ideas, new things to accomplish, rather than everybody bogged down because of this director. And so in 2003, I've been directed 10 years, I resigned and I resigned from the public health service and just turned it over. This was a Friday that I resigned and word got out very fast. And out of the clue, a very skilled neurologist who was the chairman of neurology at Johns Hopkins, which was just 30 miles away, called me. His name was Guy McCann. And Guy said, Marie, uh, I hear you're retiring. I said, yes, that's right, Guy, I'm retiring. He said, what do you plan to do? I said, improve my golf game. He said, no, seriously, do you have anything in mind? And I said, no, I didn't. And Guy said, well, a position has just opened up. And 
I'm head of the search team looking for it, and it is to become the director of the Cerebral Palsy Research Center. And interestingly enough, its headquarters is in Washington, D.C., in your backyard. And he said, would you be interested? And I said, well, number one, I don't know that much about cerebral palsy to lead an organization. And uh, so uh, I'm not sure it's a wise decision. And Guy said, oh, don't worry about that. He said, as you know, we teach in neurology here at Johns Hopkins, and you can come down here every second day, take the course, and you'll know everything about it. Well, to make a long story short, I took the job and uh, became the director of the Cerebral Palsy Research. This was a separate organization separate from the United Cerebral Palsy. It just so happened that they were in the same building on the same floor. And the head of the United Cerebral Palsy asked me, once I got there, them acquainted, if I would serve as the medical consultant to UCPA. And I said, of course. Well, I then examined the research that Selma was a research ambition and found one very small inside. Secondly, it actually had difficulty to give money away, even though it had some, because there were very few investigated interested in cerebral both. Oh, I said, well, let's think about that. While this was going off, I reorganized the organization I had a board of joy. These were wealthy people who served on the board, gave the organization overall vigilance and provided the money. And so I decided the time had come take the sleepy board of directors and try to invent. And so I looked around, kept a few of the older, got some new. As the president of the board of directors, I was able to influence a man by the name of Leonard Goldens. Leonard was the founder and president of a new television station. Old Channel Five. He was its director. And then I asked Leonard, could he help me find some other of stature and who had money? And he introduced me with shock by the name of Paul Volker. Paul Volker Paul was the chairman of the Federal Reserve very wealthy man, a very vigorous man. He did allow much grass to grow under his feet. And when it introduced me to Paul, we had a conversation and Paul agreed to join the bowl. Uh, and so I, using this kind of methodology, I was able to put together a new board of directors made up of very wealthy. But on the board, there were some people who had served on the previous board. One of them was a man of the name Chop. This was an older man whose health was not very good. And they, unfortunately, in a short while, Mr. Trump died. But his position was taken over by himself, some was called Donald. And so my board became a very influential. We had a lot of discussions 
about why cerebral palsy research was not going anywhere. And it wasn't because the projects were being turned down, people wanted to play. And so we came up with the idea that maybe our program would have stopped by developing new investors. And so we started a program of making small grants, 50, no research, $50,000 a year, et cetera. We're making grants of $50,000 a year, each or three years, to young investors who just start an And the temptation of getting, quote, easy money attracted them to working in that area, that area was so. And so we were not going into competition with NIH, who provided funds for established, skilled, highly productive. We were getting money on new horses who were just entering the race. And if they would work in our field, we would give them startup. By the way, they could not apply for a second grant. They got the first grant, and if it was successful, go to NRH. And so, my second accomplishment, if I can use that term, was recruiting a whole new group of young industry to work on a problem called service. And the board of directors was enthusiastic about it and provided the funds necessary. Uh, an interesting side story, we would meet, a review committee would review the application three times a year. And we would pick some that looked, well, it looked reasonable. It was a young person, but it was an idea that needed some pursuit. And so, let me make something up. We would get approved three or four research grants at that meeting. And then I would bring it to the board. And Mr. Golden said that $50,000 was needed for each of three years. And Mr. Golden said, would say, okay, I'll give $25,000. How much will you give? John, how much you give? And by the time... Ten minutes elapsed, we had all the money we wanted from the board members. We didn't go to the public. This was from the board members. And we established a cerebral palsy research program for a new field. And it, it worked really quite well. And so that, that was my second achievement. And my third and the last achievement was, as I told you, the United Cerebral Palsy Association, which was the mother organization of all the state cell palsy, was right there on the same floor in our office in Washington. And I was their medical officer and uh, learned from them what was going on locally. And sudden, something kind of captured my attention. And that was, cerebral palsy was considered a problem of the developing brain and influenced babies and young children or became spastic and locomotive problems. And at the clinical care level, which United Cell calls it was, wasn't research, but at the clinical care level, 99% of the program of providing family and patient services was for these little children, which made sense. But you know, 
Little children grow up to be bigger children, and children grow up to be adults, and they have several problems too, and they need help. They need help in the activities of daily living. It's not research, but it's help with food, with employment, with social activity, with even getting health care. And so I started asking questions about why in these clinics all over the country, silver palsy clinics, they only took care of children. Why did they take care of grown-ups? And there was a deadly silence. It wasn't that they were against it. They just were so involved with what they were doing that they hadn't given it much attention. And so the word went out to the cerebral palsy clinics to take them out of the pediatric units and make them custody units that took care of children and adults. And so a national program was opened up to take care of adults with cerebral palsy and help them with their lives. And as you see, I considered that an important thing. Absolutely. Because they had been ignored. Mm. Well, that's the story of my life in cerebral palsy. Uh, I think it laid the groundwork for national and international endeavors. I think it is still working hard We've got some amazing research results, and as you know much better than I, the adults with cerebral palsy are now a part of our family. Well, I'll quit there. What, and leave it up to you to ask any questions that I may have not done properly. Did you want to talk a little bit about the Middle East Project? Okay. And you don't have to if you don't want. That's a that's a big Well I, I don't mind doing it. it. It's your agenda. It was your um I, I call it your third retirement, right? Or your second retirement. Um Well I had uh, essentially retired from everything. Uh was getting fat, reading books. When I got a call from by this time, by the way, I spent ten years as the director of the Cerebral Palsy Foundation. Again, this 10 years thing you that I, <laughs> I had. Well, I retired. And I got a phone call from the state asking if I, I was available to meet with one of their people and talk about a project. Well, I told them I was retiring. They wanted to talk with me, fine. Well, to make a long story short, the State Department was under the influence of a request from the King of Jordan. In the North African country, many, many of the people lived in small villages where the streets were mud, etc., etc. Yes, they had big cities, of course, but a large proportion. And in many of these small communities, interestingly enough, there were children with cerebral palsy. And these kids missed school because they couldn't, they didn't know how to walk in this mud, and they couldn't get around. There was no mobile transportation. They had to walk places. And they were isolated in their own little homes. And were having a great deal of difficulty. And this was true in Jordan, in Palestine, in the West Bank. And the King of Jordan, who invited me to lunch, said that he had turned to the State Department to see if something could be done 
to educate and help these children so that they could become mobile. And the State Department had agreed and put aside a bunch of money and was looking for somebody to take the job on. And for some ungodly reason, they approached me. Well, I went and had lunch with the King of Jordan. And he told me the same story and said that he had his full cooperation if there was anything I needed. And he was interested in seeing what we did. Well, to make a long story short, three areas, Jordan, Palestine, and the West Bank, appointed small teams, a doctor, a nurse, a physiotherapist, to engage in a program collectively as a joint group testing and developing methods by which we could help these children. Now, obviously, one could say, well, why don't you just pave the streets? Well, interestingly enough, it's easier to work with children than to try to pave the streets. Then I realized when I met these teams from the three countries that we needed some very sophisticated equipment to examine the brains of the children and to make sure that it was cerebral palsy, that it wasn't a brain tumor. And these countries didn't have the equipment. I had working colleagues in Israel. So I went to Israel and spoke to a few people in high place, and they agreed to join the study. Now, they didn't have the problems with the children, but they had the equipment. They had brain scans. And as an aside, every child in this that we worked with went, was, went to Israel for a day and had its brain scanned and so that we knew exactly what was going on inside. And we developed this project. And I've told you this before, I was interested. At our first meeting, when four-person team from each of the four countries met, we met in Jordan. The Jordanians were at one side of the table, the Israelis were at another, the Palestinians were at another. They were sitting together as national groups. Eight months into the study, at a meeting, I looked up, and the doctors were sitting together, the physiologists were sitting together. They had lost their focus on their country and were now focusing on their research. And the study was done. And uh, it was successful, by the way, partially. It helped a great deal. And that was the study you referred to. The second and the study was completed, information gathered about how to train, what were the training that these children needed. And of course, the physiotherapists ever leave well. Interestingly enough, the study was completed and ended. And four years later, a second study, again with the children and trying to help them with other things, it was help them with learning, was sponsored by the Italian government. The Italians did it. And so, it was a very warm experience. And also I learned that 
these professionals in these countries, which are at, let me call it, hidden or are more interested in the health of their people than they are in winning these terrible battles. It was a wonderful experience. They can set those differences aside and in the conflict and achieve, achieve that peace for the betterment of the people and the yeah. kids. Yeah. Yeah. Did the streets ever get paved? No. Well, I can't. I shouldn't answer. I haven't been back to the Middle East for many years. Mm -hmm. I don't. I don't know, but it, uh, uh, again, I had a couple of little problems. Oh, and the king of Jordan assigned his brother yeah. to be my liaison. And when I ran into these little problems, I would turn the head and boom, it shook itself. Amazing. Amazing. You've had an amazing career and what an amazing recollection of everything, too. I, I, I can't I can't look back that far and remember the way you have and and it's tremendous um uh to hear uh these experiences the the way the way Well you... the research on cerebral palsy is moving ahead mm -hmm. internationally and some remarkable findings are yeah. coming out Yeah Do you have advice for current researchers and clinicians well, you know, you can always have advice, but the important part of it is important advice. Yeah. When I was director of neurology, I would interview young men and women who were just starting their careers in the neurology institute. And I said to them, if you're successful in every project you undertake, you're not doing anything important. The hard questions are the ones that are going to be important. And you know what? You will fail in an individual project more often than you'll win. But in your failure, you learn something. Every failed project teaches you something. And then you select from those things for the next project. And if I meet an investigator who's always successful, I say they're not on the cutting edge. They're doing the safe things. If you're on the cutting edge and you have the courage to fail, but also the ability to examine your failure so that the next time you use the failed information as a basis of the new. So don't be afraid to fail. Take on the hard. It's on the hard. Now I know why people kept on asking you to come back and help. <laughs> and, and how do you want to be remembered? As a man who tried. Yeah. As a man who tried, who didn't sit back and enjoy the luxury of his titles. You know, I ended up as a two-star admiral. What the devil does that mean? You know, sit back here with little stars on my shoulders. But the important thing is your failure, not just learn from your failure and take the next step. Mm -hmm.